Hey there. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2024. There's aliens in the mall. Ha <laughs> ha. I got my friend Mark here. We're going to talk about not having a crystal ball and there are aliens in the mall. So join us for our conversation. Let's go. <laughs> All right. So, hey, Mark, how was your uh, how were your holidays? Holidays were great. Christmas was, was, was nice. I got a chance to to make the rounds with some family and get back and spend some time with people in the morning and in the evening at the same time. New Year's was great. I uh, did a little bonfire out front with the neighbors and watched some fireworks and came in just in time to watch the ball drop. So perfect, but perfect. really pretty non non-eventful. I didn't go out on amateur night. So <laughs> yeah, right. That's what we refer to New Year's Eve as amateur night for sure. We had a great New Year's Eve. We're rocking into the new year. I can't believe it's Friday, <laughs> the first week of January, and we're already rolling uh, really, really fast, full steam ahead. So we want to talk a, a little bit about what does 24 look like? Man, we don't have a crystal ball, like we said, but um, we hear a lot of people talking about what the market's doing. And if you go out on the internet, you can find 10 stories that all say something different about what's going on. And so since we don't have a crystal ball, we do need to look back historically and see, hmm, has this happened before? <laughs> um, yes, it has. It has. The market is cyclical, right? It goes up, it goes down. And that's what the market does. You know, do politics influence it? Sure. Does the weather influence it? Sure. Does the economy influence it? Sure. But let's talk about Let's just break it down to some some basic market functions. And that is the market rates go up, the market rates go down, inventory goes up, inventory goes down, right? So we have been in the last few years and kind of this really strange vortex of things going on. First, we didn't have inventory, then the rates fell, uh, then everybody was selling, and then we were having bidding wars, and then the rates ticked up, and then inventory uh, tightened again because... The people who have the inventory have the low, you know, interest rates, and they're kind of unwilling to let go of those rates at this point. Um, if they aren't going to get a really big payday, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, where are they going to go, right? So they're going to end up paying that higher rate. We got the Fed announcing the first quarter of this year, there's going to be a tick down. And that brings me to what we're doing today. I brought my friend Mark on to talk a little bit about what it looks like to buy a house right now and what it will look like buying a house in, in the next couple of months. And the one thing we were talking about offline that kind of really spurred me was that the person with the right credit buying the right property, they can get 5.9%, you know, you know why? Because Mike has, or Mark has a, um, a wholesale approach to lending. It's not like the banks. And so I'm not saying that that's his rate. I'm just saying that's an example. And the example is, is that just because you hear that the rates are really, really high, doesn't mean they're going to be high for you. What it does mean is that when we look forward into what's going to happen in 24 and the rates do go down, guess what's going to happen? We just saw what happened when the rates go down. People's hair stands straight up. The sellers want to sell, buyers want to buy, and we're in a bidding war. So I brought my friend Mark on today to talk a little bit about when's the best time to buy. So Mark, when's the best time to buy something? Absolutely right now. Exactly. <laughs> bravo, bravo. Exactly. And, and do you agree with me? Historically, we're seeing the same thing, like we're going to dip down a little bit, and then all of a sudden, it's going to go crazy again. Yeah, so so like you said, this this business, the the housing market, the mortgage industry, all of them are cyclical businesses, and they run hand in hand. And what I talk about hand in hand and correlation in rate versus home price. Normally, when you see low interest rates, you see increases in 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 home pricing and and asking price. Just the same way as when rates go up, usually that's based on the Fed trying to cool spending to tame inflation. And basically what they're doing is they're trying to make you not buy. And, and 
it has that effect. It, it slows down the real estate market. You feel it at the gas pump. You feel it at the grocery store. Yeah, Basically, yeah. they are trying to curb spending. And that, that's what happens. So taking a look at what has happened over the last couple of years, and I know that I've talked about this on one of the webcasts that we've done before, was that when interest rates right before they started to make that that incline because right about june of 2023 they almost doubled overnight they went from being in the in the high threes to the low fours to being in the sixes and peaked or at least if i'm believing what i'm reading peaked at close to eight percent here just recently but here here is the funny thing so when we were at three and a half, three and three quarters. Let's go say maybe to March of 2023. And I know I've told this story on one of our previous podcasts. I had a real estate investor who was trying to find a home here in the Tampa Bay area. Um, they live up in New Jersey. They own a couple homes down here now and they're, they're, they're pretty well-to-do investors. They made offers on 11 different properties and got denied on every one of them. <sighs> one of the properties that they actually ended up buying, the list price on it was $599,000. They offered $680,000, waiving appraisal, waiving inspection, and they were still denied. But because that buyer's financing fell through, they were the backup offer and came back around and got a chance to buy that house. But that's sort of relevant as to what we want to talk about today. Now, you know, needless to say, and we're going to talk a little bit here in a bit about, you know, liquidity and and the different types of offers and the different types of loans available and how one may be more attractive to a seller than another. But, you know, these were people that, that were, were very well positioned and were still having problems. If you were a family that was looking to buy a house for yourself at that point in time, you wouldn't have been able to get in the running because you would have gone out to an open house, found 10 cash investors there offering well over price. And if you were not in a strong liquid financial position to compete with that, you definitely were not going to get in on, on the offering. Well, so, not only that, they were overpaying for the property. Absolutely. So, Flash forward to, okay, so now we go to interest rates being in the mid threes, upper threes, to jumping up into the sixes, to jumping up into the sevens, almost 8%. There has not been a lot of sales activity because people that own homes, when they sell them, unless they're going to a retirement home or going to live with a family member, they are buyers again. And unless they're going to make a cash offer and own the house outright, they're going to go from possibly a 3% mortgage that they've been able to obtain during this historically low period to a higher interest rate. And there was no interest in them doing so. So therefore the inventory has been very, very small. That being said, and I'm, I'm speaking specifically of people that are looking to buy homes to make their, either their, their, forever home or at least their stepping stone to their forever home, but it's, it's an owner occupied situation right now, I believe is the sweet spot for you to buy. And I know we talk all the time about now is the time to buy how if you buy now and interest rates go down, you can refinance and put yourself in a better position. If rates grow, go up, you'll be happy that you bought now instead of looking at a nine, nine and a half percent interest rate. But let's talk about the, the flip side of that. Right now, because we've had interest rates that have been up and we've had everybody that have sort of made a mass exodus out of the in, out of the marketplace, you've now got sellers who are willing to talk to you, are willing to negotiate, are willing to do different things that, that might make it easier for you to buy their property because they're probably in a position of either A, they have to sell, or B, they're going to jump in at a point in time where it's just not crazy out there. And right now, like I said, so the mortgage industry is never going to put you in a position where 
you're feeling like you're having to rob Peter to pay Paul. We have very specific uh, equations that we use as far as guidelines for your debt to income ratio so that we don't make sure that you overextend yourself. And those are going to be true whether the interest rate is 8% or the interest rate is 3%. But right now we, we've hit down into the upper to mid sixes. Um, I am a wholesale lender, so a lot of times I can do a lot better than institutional lenders like your banks and your credit unions. But one thing I do know is true is that right now I think it's the sweet spot because if interest rates continue to drop and let's say we go down into the low fives or the upper fours, you're going to see a flood of people back into the market again and you're going to be in a spot where you're going to have to compete with other people for what may be your, your dream home. Whereas well, I let me, let me pause you right there. Everybody, sure. did you just hear that right now we're in the sixes and Mark can get you kissing the fives. If they reduce it to kissing the fives, he can get you kissing the fours. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's the difference between a wholesaler and a retailer. And that's, that's uh, important. It is important who you choose uh, to get your financing through. And the struggle doesn't change. It's still debt to income. It's still the property. You know, there are so many variables at play when you go to get a mortgage. But I want to really punch that home um, that Mark can offer you a wholesale uh, experience in lending. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, no, just basically. So, so like I said, right now, because we're we're right in the, in, in, in the middle of, of that needle moving up and down and moving up and down. And we saw it, what happens to it on both extremes when interest rates were really low and right before they started going up, we had a flood of people in the market way overpaying for homes and the competition in the marketplace for people that were looking to buy their primary residence. They, they were just, they, they were not on the radar. We went to, seven and a half, seven and three quarters, 7.875 interest rates. And all of a sudden, everybody who was in that category said, well, these interest rates are ridiculous. Let me just say they're not historically high interest rates. They're just higher than the historical lows that we have seen over a period of time. Well, we've become accustomed to those low numbers. And, and now um, inflation is uh making it more painful i think too oh, you know on oh, every I, front a, absolutely so that's the other thing i've got to get my head around when i'm talking to people about this because i say you know we use the same mathematical equations for pre-approving your loan based on debt to income ratios but the other thing that i'm i've got to think about is the part that doesn't go into that calculation also is being hit by inflation as well so that that has a little bit of bearing as well so there's a lot of exterior factors that, that are playing into what's going on in the market. But the, the thing I think I'm trying to, to get across mostly today is that you don't want to be late to the party. You don't want to stay out thinking, OK, I'm going to wait for interest rates to get into the, the low fives or the high fours before I trickle back into the market. Because when you do, so has everybody else. And then all of a sudden, there's all that competition in the marketplace. I've always said, and 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 it's not just an adage that I say, but now is a great time to buy. And now, especially in my mind, because I think we're in that sweet spot. We're in that spot where the market was a little bit repressed, so to say, because of the high interest rates and, and lack of inventory and overstimulation of the market when we had low interest rates and, and a lot of people coming out to the properties for sale. We're in that sweet spot right now where you could get in right now and probably find that property that you're looking for, be able to make that work for you. And if you buy now, like I said, if interest rates go up, you're happy. You're happy you bought now. If interest rates go down, you can refinance and put yourself in a better financial position. But right now, because there's there's been lower activity in the industry and in the marketplace, I think that the people right now are going to be the pioneers in before we have that boom again. And when we have that boom again, those people that were maybe looking to get in there, like I said, are going to have a little tougher time trying to find what it is that they're looking for. Well, and and to kind of really uh, support what you're saying, I have sellers 
we took their property off the market um, because it was just sitting there. And, um, you know, we're, we are preparing our relaunch of those properties. I have several clients like that. Um, they opted to go ahead and take their property temporarily off the market um, and then relaunch after the first of the year. Well, it's relaunch time. I think February is relaunch time. I think January, you know, we're going to keep an eye. We're going to have some data come in from December. Uh, we're going to have uh, more of a view of what's in front of us with the feds because they're going to harp on it because every day there's a brand new article about the housing industry. <laughs> so surely we'll get something new tomorrow <laughs> about it. But I think, you know, taking the month and reviewing and then hitting it hard in February, knowing that March, we will see hopefully a tick, if not sooner from the feds. Um, you know, there's a good possibility that this is a, a great time to get your house on the market. At least, right. you know, with my clients, that's what we're working on is, is getting our properties. On. So I feel like that's probably indicative of a lot of people who were going to sell, pulled back, and now they're going to actually relaunch because people are saying, hey, it's coming, it's coming. It's They're not all going to relaunch at the same time. So that's where the buyer has an opportunity to get out there now ahead of the crowds, right? Ahead of the, of the wave. Right. This time. Absolutely. And, and you got to know that that wave is coming. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you in on something. And, and you know this just as well. You know what kind of data that we have available to us as far as different things and everything like that. So when I'm fielding phone calls all day from people not only asking about a property that I own that's off the market, if I would like to sell it for a cash price, but call me about my mother's home in Ohio, somehow have me connected to that. Hey, do you have any interest in selling this? Pro I don't own that property. They're out in front of the curve because they know that there's going to be a market that's coming soon. And, and you got to believe that, you know, there, there are people that have made millions in the industry being in front of the curve and in front of the market saying, hey, this is the next wave that's coming. Let's get ourselves inventory, inventory rich so that we can capitalize on this. My phone rings at minimum four times a day from an investor. Do you have any properties? Um you know, they're hunting inventory. They're hunting yep. inventory to buy. Yep. So let's talk, can we switch over really quick and just kind of talk about people who are renting? Um, you know, there is a group of people who have uh, been waiting to jump from rentals to making a purchase. And then there are people who maybe want to sell and rent for a while. Can we talk a little bit about what the advantages or disadvantages of renting are at this point? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I sent you some information on this morning. I don't know if we can pull it up on the screen, but if you take a look if I can at share. what historical rentals have done, I mean, I went back to like 1940, I want to believe from, from rentals and everything like that to, to current day. And there's that historical median monthly rents chart just down there below that. You can see that current day, it's like 1191. If you go back to 1940, $27 was the median rent. Man. <laughs> and you can see how that chart has gone up. And this is why, in my opinion, home ownership is really, really good. You know, I read articles here as of late about how millennials may decide that they don't want to buy and they may rent forever. Well, that's all, all fine and good. But here's the problem is that every year rents go up. Uh, right. you know, like it says, uh, th 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 there, there's no avoiding it. I know that here where we live in Pinellas County, Florida, the maximum you can increase rents are 10% year over year. And I can guarantee you that probably every renewal of a lease is probably very, very close to that, if not that exactly. So buying a home does a couple different things. One, it fixes your cost. And what I mean by that is that you can see that rents aren't staying the same year over year. But if you buy a home, the only thing that's going to change in your monthly payment is if taxes go up and if insurances go up, which, oh, by the way, that's very probable. But let's really think about that. So here in, here in Florida, we have something called a homestead exemption. And what the homestead exemption does is it, it provides 
that your property taxes can go up no more than 3% on an annual basis. Think about that. So on $3,000 a year in property taxes, even if it went up as much as it possibly could, that's $90. That's only $7.50 a month more that you're paying. I guarantee you that is a lot less than what you're going to see your rent increase on an annual basis. And if you fix your interest rate and you fix your monthly payment principal and interest, that's never going to change. And the only time it would would be if you refinance and hopefully you're refinancing for a lower interest rate to, to make put yourself in a better financial position. Um, that being said, the other thing I will say is that by owning your home, they have kept statistics on home values for, I want to say like 81 years and 78 of those years, there was an increase in value of property, meaning that you are creating wealth by creating equity in your home. You right. aren't creating wealth for anybody by renting other than your landlord by giving him more equity in the property that he's renting to you. So I, I, I think that's the, the biggest thing that you could take away from this is that not only is buying a home a way for you to develop equity and wealth, but it is also a way for you to prevent losing your money to inflation by annually increasing rents. And it, it just makes sense to me. I, I wish I knew when I was young and dumb in my 20s what I knew now. <laughs> well, you know what? You don't build wealth renting. You yeah, build you wealth... You know, the, the the way historically we were taught, if you're 50 or over, maybe 45 or older, is that you got married, you bought a house, you built wealth, right? You built wealth together. You sold that house. You stepped up. You sold that house. You stepped up. You sold that house. That was your nest egg. You retired, bought a condo in Florida, and you were happy, right? <laughs> and so that obviously, that's not the model for everyone now, but- it still stands to reason that home buying is wealth building. Look at what's happened in the past five years. If you had owned your home prior to 2019, you would be sitting on a, a lot of equity in your property at this point, um, just because of how quickly it, it went up. They say on average across the United States that from 2019 to 2023, the average homeowner realized 130 some thousand dollars in equity right and so what do you do with it do you pull it out and go somewhere else that's the hard question right because nobody wants to be the guy that pays eight <laughs> percent but it's coming down and like mark said this is the sweet spot in time where you have inventory you do have people who are still motivated uh as far as selling and maybe uh, have being more open. You're not in a bidding war yet. You will be as soon as those rates tick down and you can refinance later if they do tick down. You know, if they tick down, you can refinance and still be the benefactor of that of that rate reduction. Right. Well, you know, basic, old, basic principles of supply and demand. That's the rental market right now. Nobody's wanting to buy. Everybody's renting and the landlords are thinking, well, I can get top dollar for my property and I can charge maximum rents for it and like i said you saw the chart that that chart it's going straight up as far as what rents are doing on an annual basis you buy a house you fix your housing cost you in five years are not paying 20 percent more than what you were paying five years ago you're paying roughly the same thing that you were paying five years ago but you have developed equity you 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 have that that if you decide you know Maybe home ownership isn't for me, and I'd like to like to buy a catamaran and sail around the world. You can sell that home, probably buy your catamaran and cash for you for every port that you hit for like a year. <laughs> well, I know a lot of people, they have been creative with their existing properties and created portions of their property to rent to offset um, maybe a, a loss in income or inflation. Um, or people who can't exactly afford uh, large homes to rent, you know, they rent rooms, rent part of their house, they are renting their house, you know, they have uh, 
when they go to per when they went to purchase, they actually purchased a house that had a mother-in-law suite or a garage apartment. And so that set them up for in case something happens, I do have a space that I can rent out. I could live in it and rent my big house out. So I mean, these are all things that you can consider too. These are good financial sound, especially if you're younger and you're entering the market. If you buy an income producing property that you're going to live in, um, that's a great strategy. Uh, getting off the rent train, you know, you get off the rent train and and then you put someone on your rent train. And then if you feel like maybe you don't want to do that, you will kind of want um, the, the property to yourself for a while. Great. And then you run into a bump down the road, or maybe there's a change in life. You can rent the whole thing. That's also uh, a way to kind of get into uh, building wealth for yourself. So the, 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 it's held true that probably over the years, the most reliable vehicle for investment is real estate. Absolutely. Without a doubt. It's tangible. You can hold it. You got to pay taxes on it. You got to insure it. You know, there's uh, it's going to be there. It can, it's going to go up and down, but it will go up again, even if it goes down. I mean, look at what we went through and what, from 06 all the way to 12, you know, we, we, we struggled for those years trying to get that market back um, before we got hit with the pandemic, which was completely unforeseen. And what it did to the market was something we had never experienced before, but it still went up and it still went down. So real estate is still real estate and you still can build wealth with it, whether you buy it uh, at the right time or not, you can still benefit one way or another. If you buy it when the rates are high, then you can refinance when they're low. If you buy it when when uh, the rates are low, then and you don't need to refinance and your equity builds up faster. So, Absolutely. you know, it's a win-win. Absolutely. But, you know, like I said, I, I, I can't state enough. I think that somebody who's looking to buy that's that they're planning on planting roots and planting their flag right now, I believe is your sweet spot because we're right in between those two different scenarios, scarcity versus overstimulation. Well, you're, that's you're right what in I'm that spot name. and you can be a pioneer into it. So that's right. That's what I'm going to name the video, the sweet spot. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to cut it off. I, we want to do another video, maybe a part two to this. Maybe it's a different video, but we do need to stop, uh, to do something about assumable loans. I have a lot of questions from people about assumable loans. Um, so we need to kind of maybe um, do uh, a video explaining the mechanics of what that means because people don't really understand it. Um, and I think that that would probably be a good thing. Not only assumable loans, but the different types of loans and really more seriously, back to the real estate state side of it, as a listing agent, what is a attractive offer what is the most attractive offer and what is the pecking order in that for your seller yeah and we're going to stop right there we're not going to spill the beans on that we're going to save that for the next video so stay tuned thanks for joining us and uh i will put the links to a couple of these articles that we showed uh in the description so i hope you're having a great new year we will talk to you soon thank you debbie you're welcome